Hey guys, welcome to chapter 10 and 9. This is where your textbook starts to get a little complicated. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to piece together the information that I think you need to know for the narrative of the story. And then we're going to make that fit with what your textbook thinks you need to know and how. So I'm going to be jumping around a lot. Don't get confused. When you're doing your homework, make sure that you follow the order of the questions I've given you. Don't worry, as a narrative this will make sense, even if your textbook is a little strange. You're going to have to promise me here, or, or promise me something here. Our eventual goal is to get to the Civil War. We have to set up a bunch of pieces before it can happen. This is the start of that process. So again, don't freak out if you're reading your textbook and on one page is talking about the year 1818, on the next page is talking about the year 1845 that's going to happen don't let that throw you this is going to be a kind of a jumbled mess but once the civil war officially starts in chapter 15 once we get there you're going to step back and go oh now i get it okay so again you're going to see a lot of puzzle pieces these next couple of weeks do not let them throw you we will get to the civil war it will make sense when we get there okay that being said let's start chapter 10 with a sprinkling of chapter nine. Okay, so the real way to start this story is to start with the election of 1824. One of the general themes of this unit is going to be what we call political democratization. That's a fancy way of saying that who votes, how they vote, and what way they vote is going to change. Historically, the people that could vote were going to be the rich white men that owned property. Well, as 1824 rolls around, and specifically all the way up until the Civil War, the opinions on who can vote and why and how are going to change. The new idea with political democratization is that voters no longer need to own property to vote. Which is nice. Not everyone owns property, so now non-property owners um, are going to be able to vote. This has a significant effect when it comes to um, the Industrial Revolution, which ironically we're going to talk about after we talk about all this stuff. We'll get to it. But basically, Americans are slowly starting to move away from farms, which means that um, they're not necessarily going to own actual land anymore. They're still going to have money, potentially, if they're working in a factory, but they're not going to own land. So we have to change the requirements on who can vote and why. We also have written anonymous ballots, or sorry, ballots, uh, rather than just people standing in a room raising their hand for who they support. You'd be surprised how things change when the voting is anonymous versus having to actually say it out loud. Now, there's still only one political party during this time period. It's still the Jeffersonian Republicans, but there's going to be some obvious tensions when it comes to what is going on in the country. Right now, we have five, or sorry, well, five, four candidates running for office. The ones we care about are this dude named Andrew Jackson, who, spoiler alert, we're going to spend more time talking about, uh, Martin Van Buren, who's hanging out in the background for a while, Henry Clay, who's a name we haven't brought up yet, but he's going to be a big part of our story, um, and this dude named John Quincy Adams, who was the son of the former president, John Adams who, by the way, is on the verge of death. But that's okay. He lived for a long time. Anyway, um, because there are so many... Why are there so many political candidates, you might be asking yourself? Well, remember that fancy S word we talked about? Sectionalism? When I said that certain parts of the country are different from other parts? That problem is going to be a huge issue, really, for the rest of this class up until the Civil War. The North and South are different. But what makes things crazy is the West becomes super different. What is the West going to be? Is the West going to be an industrialized area like the North? Is it going to be an agrarian area like the South? We don't know. So what starts to happen in this country is you see the North go one way, the South go another way, and the question is which, which way is the West going to go? Now before I talk about this election, look at this picture here in the lower right. You can see that when this election goes down, holy cow, the areas of the country are really, really diverse and they're really split up. Um, 
sometimes this election is called the favored sons election because each region votes for a president or sorry votes for a candidate that would most accurately reflect what they would want for example john quincy is from the north he's going to vote for things that people in the north would want andrew jackson is from the south he's going to vote for things that the south would want henry clay is big on westward expansion so the westward the western territories are going to vote for him you can kind of see how this is going to work here so we have a diverse nation that has diverse ideas we're going to have diverse political candidates but only one political party do you think that's going to last it ain't the era of good feelings is going to be over let's talk about how that era ends how on earth does the era of good feelings end we were all so happy what could have possibly broken up the era of good feelings well an election check it out <clears throat> What's going to happen, and you guys can kind of see this in this graph, assuming you have this blown up super big, you'll notice that um, Jackson, who is in green, wins a majority of the Electoral College and the American popular vote. So obviously, Andrew Jackson becomes president, and there was no problems, and everyone's happy, right? Well, no. Here's the problem. Andrew Jackson won, but he didn't win enough of the vote. We had this weird rule in America, um, and it's different now, but at the time, you had to have 51% of the votes to act of the Electoral College vote um, in order to actually become president. That's actually, I take that back, that's still the rule today. Anyway, you have to have 51% of, of the Electoral College vote, but as you can see, the Electoral College did not side um, in a majority fashion. What ends up happening when this goes down, according to the Constitution, if the Electoral College can't decide on the president, it gets bounced to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives gets to decide. Henry Clay, who you can see here in orange, is obviously not going to win. He is the weakest candidate. But Henry Clay is like the top heavyweight boxer in Congress. People do what he says. So here's what, here's what Henry Clay says to Congress. He says, I'm going to throw my support behind John Quincy Adams. Adams is then going to be um, selected um, president, basically, by Congress. So what ended up happening here, um, we call this the corrupt bargain. Here's why. Adams becomes president because Henry Clay decides to support John Adams. They're BFFs. But, and here's what Adams will do in return. In return for being um, selected as president, John Adams is going to go, hey, Henry Clay, congratulations. You are now my Secretary of State. So what, you might be asking? Well, Secretary of State basically was the next guy that was going to be president. If you are Secretary of State, you're almost guaranteed the presidency. In fact, several of the last presidents were Secretary of State before they became president. So if John Quincy Adams makes Henry Clay his Secretary of State, Henry Clay can almost guaranteed expect to become president in the next major election. And that is how John Quincy Adams becomes president, even though he lost. There are very few elections that you have to understand expressly. Um, this is one of them. Now, what's interesting is that we don't have to concern ourselves with anything that happens while John Quincy Adams is president. There aren't any major things that or laws that are passed between 1824 and 1828. There aren't any major political actions that are taking place between 1824 and 1828 that involve John Quincy. Why? Well, he kind of stole the presidency, and he's not going to be able to get much done. John Quincy is a really, really brilliant man, but he's not seen as a good president um, because he didn't really do the things that were expected of him while president, and nobody really liked how he won. The American public felt really upset by this election so ex upset in fact that this is going to make another person super popular andrew jackson is one of my favorite political characters he's one of my favorite characters in this story he is a fascinating man to study because like i've said before 
he's essentially this mass murdering psychopath that becomes president but ends up doing a really good job he's this elitist um super jealous crazy man that ends up really violently almost protecting the average american let's talk about him <clears throat> rather than walk away from politics after andrew jackson loses this election he instead this, uh, spends the next four years essentially creating a new political party um Jackson and his best friend, Martin Van Buren, are going to realize that America needs two political parties in order to truly be strong. It was impossible for the government to be cohesive if there was only one party, because it, the parties, you need to have a clash in order to have democracy. If you only have one political party, you only have one political opinion, that's not really democracy. That's just a fancy dictatorship. So Andrew Jackson's going to say, you know what, we need a second political party because it's going to allow us to foster and grow democracy. And he's right, by the way. Jackson and Van Buren are going to create what we now know as the Democratic Party. Now, here's where it gets weird, though, because Jackson would not really be a Democrat if he were alive today. So, again, things get a little strange. The Democratic Party of this time period is going to support um, states' rights. This is actually, they're really much more true to Jeffersonians. Now again, let's keep this, let's keep this clear because it's going to get a little weird. Jackson is from the South. The South always, always supports individual and state rights over national rights. So, in the election of 1824, a Northerner, John Quincy Adams, wins. He kind of turns the Jeffersonian Republican Party a little bit more to favor the North. Well, that's not going to make um, people in the South or even out West happy. Hence, the rise of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party of this time period, which are sometimes known as the Jacksonian Party, are going to want states' rights um, over, over a strong government. States' rights, states' rights. <clears throat> now, this is actually going to lead to the death of the Republican Party mainly because uh, it's going to lose a lot of support and it's going to reform itself. Let me show you a chart on the next page. Okay, so let's do a recap of political parties in America. We started with really no political party uh, when the Constitution is written. Then there's a de debate over the Constitution. So we had the Federalist on one side and we have the Anti-Federalist on the other. The Anti-Federalists are going to die uh, with the invention, or sorry, addition of the Bill of Rights. So the Anti-Federalists are dead. We don't care about them anymore. The Federalist Party is going to end up splitting, um, mainly because of the election of 1800. It's going to split. The Federalist Party is going to end up dying by the uh, 1820 because they're not going to be seen as important anymore. And instead, for a little while, we have the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. And now there's only one political party. We're in the era of good feelings. We're rolling through the War of 1812. Things are going great until the election of 1824. In the election of 1824, um, there's a, four candidates running to be president. They're all from different regions. We have a lot of sectional tensions. And essentially, we're going to split this whole party up. On the one hand, we have the Jacksonian Democrats, who are going to be big supporters of state states' rights. On the other hand, we have this group called the National Republicans um, who are going to change their name to the Whigs just because, you know, Whigs are a cool name. Um, that's essentially what's going on there. So now we have, again, two political parties. And that's actually good for America. It really is. But this is what it kind of looks like. I'll explain it more in class, but hopefully this chart will help you. It's going to stay this way until about the time of the Civil War. Once the Civil War breaks out, we'll look at this chart again, and we'll make some more edits. And then, thankfully, it gets a little bit more stable after all of that. Okay, moving on. It is now 1828. Nothing of any consequence has happened in the last four years, except for the fact that Andrew Jackson is becoming more and more and more popular. Jackson decides to run again as his new political party, known as the Jacksonian Democrats. Um, and these dudes are going to duke it out. This is a really, really nasty election. Um, 
But throughout the course of the election, Andrew Jackson is going to say, I support the common man. He's going to basically say that government has gotten too elitist. And if you think about it, all the presidents up to this point are big, rich, famous, important men. But none of them actually accurately reflect who America is. America is a group of poor agrarian farmers. And what do we have as our presidents? These really, really rich lawyers. Well, now we're going to have a poor, uneducated person basically become president, even though he wasn't poor anymore. He was raised poor. He's going to become president, and he's going to start saying, you know what? This country needs to accurately reflect the people living here. We need to care about the common man. We need to make the government care about the common man. So once Jackson wins, this is what he starts to really focus on. First thing he does while president is basically kicks out all the people that don't agree with him. It's called the rotation of office or the spoils system. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, to the victor, go the spoils? If not, read more books. But anyway, what that means is that the person who wins should be able to make the important decisions. Andrew Jackson is a Democrat, and when he wins, what he is going to do, he's going to kick out every person that is a Republican or a Whig. He doesn't care. If you're not a Democrat, he's going to kick you out of office and give your job to someone that agrees with him. It's almost like the reverse of Midnight Judges. Midnight Judges were given jobs right before Adams left. Now, in this case, as soon as a new political party takes office, they kick out everyone that's different from them. It's a pretty smart idea. Or a very astute idea, as it were. I like it. It's smart. Um, on top of that, he's going to have a uh, his advisors, his cabinet. They're great guys, but they're not great advisors. They're not super smart. So we call them the kitchen cabinet because they were kind of thrown together. They're good buddies, but they're not good political advisors. They're going to cause some problems for Jackson, but that's not something we're going to talk about later. Now, by the way, I say Andrew Jackson cares about the common man. That's the common white man. Andrew Jackson has little or no concern for natives or slaves. That's going to be a story that we will see as time goes on. Okay, so now that we have our president, let's talk about some stuff that goes down while he is president. This is going to be one of those sections where the textbook's going to jump around a lot. I'll try to guide you through it. Um, they're not super complicated. There's just, you know, things involved that we got to talk about. All right. The first thing that goes down is this thing called the nullification crisis. Now, we've talked about nullification before. Nullification happened uh, with the idea of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and the compact theory where the... Um, where Jefferson was saying that the, the Alien and Sedition Acts need to be nullified. So you already know what a nullification is. But now there's going to be another crisis. This is the big one. I introduced that problem of nullification earlier on, but now this is the big one that um, the AP board loves to ask you guys about. So here's the story. One of the other ways that this country raised money without having an income tax on people, one other way that it did it was through the use of tariffs. Now tariffs are taxes on trade. I'll repeat that. Tariffs are taxes on trade, specifically on imports. What was happening here um, was that the, the British were using their empire, or they were using whatever, to make a product. Now, they would bring that product here to the United States. In the United States, we made a very similar product. The problem was the British products were cheaper. So we had to do something to make it so that way it would be le it would be more expensive to buy a British product. That way we could create jobs in America. Now we actually have a similar problem here today. We have this problem in reverse where we have sent many of our jobs overseas as a means of making America uh, as a means of making products cheaper. As a result, we've lost jobs here in the United States today. That's what we that's what we've done. Now let's roll on back to the 1800s though. We are just starting to grow as an industrial nation. We'll talk about this later. But the problem is we're having a hard time competing because British, the British people can make things cheaper than we can. So we have to do something to make it so that way the British goods cost more. You could see it here in this graph. 
on the right hand side you have a British cloth being made and on the left hand side you have an American made cloth when they're created they both cost four dollars now in reality that British cloth would cost less to make people buy American and to help encourage American growth we're gonna add a tariff to that cloth to make it cost a dollar more you as a consumer when you go to the store you're going to buy the cheaper product so you're gonna buy the American made product that's four dollars versus the British product that's the exact same that costs five that's why tariffs exist so in places like the American North where they are just starting to industrialize and make things they want tariffs to be really high the North wants tariffs to be high the South on the other hand wants tariffs to be low why because the South makes money selling things to Great Britain specifically cotton if we put a tax on or a tariff I should say on items that are made in Great Britain what do you think Great Britain does to American made products sold there they put a tariff exactly so this can have negative consequences in the north I'll repeat they want tariffs to be high that way their products are cheaper in the south they want tariffs to be low that way they can do business with other countries so the year is now 1828 um, and the existing tariff is already set pretty high the North is going to demand that Jackson pass a higher tariff. It's called the Tariff of 1828. John C. Calhoun, pictured here on the right, um, obviously surprised by his haircut, or maybe sitting on a toilet or something, um, is the current vice president, and he is very upset over this idea of a raised tariff. Calhoun is a Southerner, and he realizes that a higher tariff is actually very bad for the South. Now Calhoun also, by the way, side note, wants to become president one day, and you don't become president by pissing off the South. It doesn't work. You have to keep the South happy. So he's going to say, an increase in a tariff, we're going to call this the tariff of abominations, because that word sounds so evil. Um, and basically, the vice president speaks out and says that Andrew Jackson is wrong, you know, the president. Um, he's going to argue the compact theory, saying that the southern states don't agree with this tariff and then we're gonna go go ahead and nullify this tariff and we're gonna go ahead and leave the union and rabble 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 and I'm the vice president rabble 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 things are getting pretty contentious in America and Jackson has just started to be president it continues on this is gonna make its way to the floor of Congress and Senator Daniel Webster uh, drawn here to the upper right He's not at the bottom of this picture, I promise. Um, responds to Calhoun by giving a two-day speech in which he argues against the compact theory. So I'll repeat. John C. Calhoun is going to argue the compact theory, saying the southern states can leave because they hate this tariff. Meanwhile, a senator from the north, Daniel Webster, is going to stand up and go, no. Here's what he says. The compact does exist, but the compact is between the people and the federal government, not the states. If a state were to nullify an act of the federal government, it is no different than treason and it would be punished accordingly. The tariff's going to pass. We're going to increase the tariff a little bit. Um, Calhoun is so upset that he resigns as vice president in order to lead a resistance movement in the South. And in the South, specifically South Carolina, because they're always contentious, South Carolina's like, that's it, we're out of here. And South Carolina threatens to secede. They threaten to nullify this law. Jackson, being the president, his job is to what? Enforce the laws. Exactly. So Jackson's going to send a bunch of troops down to the South, down to South Carolina, and say, hey, you have to enforce this tariff whether you like it or not. On top of that, Congress is going to pass something called the Force Bill, pictured here to the lower part. The force bill is going to basically give the president the ability to use troops to enforce the rules as he deems necessary. Now, I'm not saying that Andrew Jackson could call down a Star Destroyer by using the force, but I'm also not saying that he couldn't. We don't know. This guy is crazy. He might be able to pull that off. Long story short, the whole crisis blows over. Um, Congress is going to uh, pass a follow-up bill that says tariffs are going to be gradually lowered over the next 20 years. It makes the South happy, and the whole crisis blows over. Mullen, I feel like you talk about a lot of things building up to a huge, horrible crisis, and then they blow over. Is that how politics always seems to work? 
Yeah, go ahead and research this thing called Obamacare. It was supposed to destroy the country two years ago. It still hasn't. Let's recap the entire story, just to make sure we got it. The North wants a higher tariff. The South does not. A higher tariff passes. The vice president loses his mind and freaks out and basically is going to encourage South Carolina to nullify this tariff, leading to potentially a civil war. Uh, Samuel, Senator Daniel Webster and Andrew Jackson are going to argue that the South has no right to do this. We're going to bring some troops into the South with the force bill and stop any sort of secessionist or nullification movement. And fortunately, the entire thing blows over. Crazy story, right? I know. That's history. All right. It is now 1832, and it's time for another election. Don't worry. We got some other stories to tell, but we'll get to them in a minute. <clears throat> now, look at this chart, and you will notice, holy cow, Jackson runs away with this. You'll also notice that he's uh, the only actual full-on Democrat here, and he's going to take a lot of prestige. Poor Henry Clay. He's going to run for office like four times and lose every single time. He might be the most important senator of all time. He can just never be president. Anyway, um, we have something here. Um, when someone wins a landslide by a pretty significant majority, or they win the election, I should say, by a pretty significant majority, we call it a landslide. Notice uh, the Electoral College vote. Andrew Jackson gets 77% of the Electoral College vote. That's a pretty healthy number. In fact, we would say that President Jackson has a popular mandate. A popular mandate means that the American public is essentially behind the president. So the American public is behind um, Andrew Jackson, which allows Andrew Jackson to do something slightly controversial. He probably couldn't do what he's about to do next if he didn't have the public's support, if he didn't have the popular mandate. Andrew Jackson decides, being a advocate of the common man and being an advocate of states' rights, he decides that he does not like the Bank of the United States. In fact, he's now made it his goal to kill Alexander Hamilton's Bank of the United States. Let's see how he does it. Now, the year is also 1832, and the second Bank of the United States, as it is now called, is up for renewal. Um, this happens. Congress passes things, and then they, they have an expiration on it. That way it needs to be revoted re on to see if the people still want it. Well, Andrew Jackson and a lot of the American people don't like the idea of this bank. It makes the federal government too strong, and Jacksonian Democrats are big advocates of states' rights. So, um, when, this, when this bank comes up, or when this bank comes up for renewal, Jackson decides he wants to kill it. Here are some problems with this bank. Number one, it's controlled by a group of wealthy people, not ordinary citizens. So that's going to make Jackson upset. Remember, he's an advocate of the common man, not the common rich man. Number two, the government doesn't have a lot of control over this bank, which is going to be kind of a problem. Number three, it's extremely corrupt. Wait, something's corrupt without the government being involved? I know, I'm shocked too. And finally, number four, this bank is to blame for something called the Panic of 1819. You don't know what that is yet, but you will eventually. So just write it down, and we'll talk about that later. Congress is going to approve the renewal of this bank, but Andrew Jackson's going to veto it, and he vowed to kill this bank forever. Because that's just how he do. He was convinced the government needed to stay out of economic affairs. Well, unfortunately, Congress is going to say no, they still want this bank. So Andrew Jackson is going to go ahead and take all the government money out, of the Bank of the United States and instead put it in banks that are controlled by the individual states. We call them pet banks. Essentially what happened here is that uh, it bankrupted the Bank of the United States. Then on top of that, Andrew Jackson's going to say, you know what? He wants all payments to the government to be made in specie or gold. So rather than using paper money, he wants every payment to the government to be made in actual gold. Essentially, this is going to destroy the American economy, but more importantly, it destroys the second bank of the United States, which of course was the goal. The bank of the United States dies, Andrew Jackson kills it, and he is super, super excited. Good work. Okay, I mentioned the, this rise of this political party, but I didn't talk about who they were, so let's talk about who they are really quick. Jackson has been president for a couple of years now. It's almost 1836. His time as president is almost up. And now, 
um, there's going to be a birth of a new political party. So there's a theme that we haven't really mentioned yet, and I promise we will get to it, but we haven't really talked much about it yet. Uh, we've talked about westward expansion, but we haven't talked about another glaring problem. America doesn't have any infrastructure. Mr. Mullen, what's infrastructure? I'm glad you asked. Infrastructure is like, you know, paved roads or bridges or buildings and stuff like that. Now, you guys today here in whatever year this happens to be, I'm recording this in 2014, but unless I'm lazy, um, you could be, or, you know, I probably will be lazy. So you'll probably be hearing this for the next 10 years until I decide to re-record it. Um, in 2014, the federal government funds a lot of projects to build infrastructure. Things like freeways, things like bridges, things like the 210, which you guys live by, are funded by the state, and fed or specifically the federal governments, um, as needed infrastructure. Schools, they are infrastructure. Now, the big debate we have early in America is, we need these roads, but who should pay for them? Andrew Jackson is a Democrat, and he is a strong supporter of states' rights, which means he does not think the federal government should fund infrastructure. That should be funded by either private industry or the states. Many people in the North and out West are going to disagree. They're going to say that, you know what, it's the job of the federal government to work on internal improvements. They need infrastructure. Every time one of these uh, bills would be passed, Jackson would veto it and say no. So this political party, this Whig political party, is going to be a proponent of a stronger central government that's going to do more things for the people. There's also, you know, this whole slavery issue which might need to be dealt with. Um, and there's going to be some social problems in America that this group wants to deal with as well that Jackson's kind of ignoring. That is where this new political party known as the Whigs comes from. It's based off of the original ideas of the Federalist Party, you know, that party that died 20 years ago. Well, this group's going to come back. They're called the Whigs. They're basically the exact same as the Federalists. They want a bigger, more power, powerful central government that provides goods and services for the American public. The Whigs don't last long, um, and they don't actually gain much power, but they're going to be the main voice of dissent during this time period that is basically going to be anti-Jacksonian Democrat. They don't last long, but they're going to serve a very important purpose. It is now 1836, and Andrew Jackson's going to retire because he's really old. He also has like five bullets inside of him, so, you know, he might die soon. So, better not to die while in office. He's going to retire. Martin Van Buren takes his place, and um, he is going to win and become our next president. Uh, you'll notice, though, that uh, he doesn't win by as big of a majority. You'll also notice that the Whigs are going to run three candidates. Here's a hint for your future lives when you become politicians. It's always better the way our system works to have one person of one party and one person of another and no one else running. If there is one Democrat versus two Republicans, the Democratic Party will always win because of how our voting system is set up. Note, this is as of 2014. If the Electoral College ever gets changed, which I'll be excited about, that idea will change. Anyway, um, you'll see the Whigs run more than one candidate, and this is going to split the party's votes and um, make it so that way the Whigs stand no chance of actually winning this election. That's a short story, but we're done with it. Moving on. Okay, so there's one more lasting legacy of Andrew Jackson that we have to talk about before we actually travel back in time and discuss some other problems in America. All of the Jackson has killed the second bank of the United States, but this is one of the repercussions of it. You guys already know the formula for bank panics, and this time it's the same thing. For this formula, enter land cheap out west. Land becomes cheap out west, um, and people are going to invest in it, then the market improves, blah, blah, blah. It's that same formula you already know. Essentially what's going to happen, though, is that this panic is going to be on a much larger national scale. It's going to actually cause significant economic problems throughout the entire country. In fact, the entire American economy is going to be on halt for like five years. The new president, Martin Van Buren, is going to say, you know what? The bank itself might not be popular, but we need to have a place where the government stores its money to keep the economy stable, to keep prices stable. We need something that keeps our money stable. Well, that is going to be what we now know as the federal treasury. 
It's going to basically keep its own money, not give this money out to the states, who's basically going to allow the government to control and have a central basis of its money. You can read more about this. There's more details involved. But basically, really, every time I've seen this brought up, if you know that the American economy crumbles as a result of Andrew Jackson killing the second bank of the United States, you're going to be fine. Are there a thousand more details that we can go into? Sure. Do we want to? No. Do I want to? No. So I'm not. Okay. I told you guys I'm going to travel back in time, and now I'm going to. Um, in a lecture video, this seems like this is happening really fast, but of course, in class, this whole process is going to be a little bit slower and a little bit more organic, and you're going to see how it works. Um, but in this lecture video, you're like, oh my god, why are we moving backwards in time again? Um, that's just kind of how this textbook works, but I promise you, this is going to help us tell a more coherent story. By the way, you could read this warning. I've already pretty much told you this. Um, make sure you guys read the sections I'm telling you in the order I'm telling you to. And again, we are going to back up once we get uh, to the Civil War, and you'll see how all these pieces fit. I do apologize. It is kind of a jumbled story. Your textbook tells it one way. I don't agree with the way they tell you, so we're going to go a little out of order. Just hang on. This will all fit when we're done. I promise. Note, it might not actually fit on this lecture video because you're just seeing one piece of a much bigger puzzle. You have to put it all together. So if you're not my student and you're watching this from somewhere else, sorry if you're confused find a better video okay <laughs> moving on the next thing we got to talk about is going to be westward expansion another cog in this big puzzle of how we get to the civil war is going to be westward expansion america is moving on west as you can see in this map we have our original area and now we're going to be moving west especially after the war of 1812 after the war of 1812 we're going to have a general peace with europe which means we don't have to really keep a standing army anymore. We can start moving westward. Um, now, America's big thing is we're not going to have a lot of money, especially to pay people like, you know, soldiers. But you know what we have? A whole bunch of stolen land. I mean purchased land. I mean stolen land. We have an, almost an infinite supply of land. So how does the government pay people for services? We pay them in land. We're talking like 50 or 100 acres of land. That's a lot. That's several football fields of land that we just give away for free. Take it. Do whatever you want with it. We don't care. We just want people out there. Within the next 20 years after the War of 1812, so in the 1810s or teens, I guess, 20s and 30s, we have over 6 million people move west. And this time we're moving as families, not just as individuals. Um, and the society that forms out here is going to be different than the Puritan ethic. Rather than have the everyone spying on each other, it's going to be much more isolated living, um, which is going to make this idea of the American spirit. We'll talk about that more later, um, but that's kind of what's, what it's going to be out here on the frontier. If you want to know what it's like, just go ahead and ride the train at Disneyland um, from New Orleans to uh, Fantasyland, and you'll pass through what the American frontier would have looked like. And you can do it in an open-air train, but we'll talk about those later, too. Okay, moving on. Well, here comes another bank panic. This is the bank panic I told you that's going to be really bad for the Bank of the United States. I know, we rolled back in time. Just, just, just deal. You can handle this. You're smart kids. Just deal. All right, so this bank panic happens like all the other ones there's land available out west some people called speculators are gonna buy this land for cheap and then jack up the prices before they sell it to farmers okay um, after the war of 1812 more and more people are gonna to want to move west these speculators have already bought the land and jacked up the price farmers take out really expensive loans um, to be able to live out here and farm the farms don't do well and the farms close banks take back the um, the land, etc., etc. That's exactly what's happening here. You already know this story. You've already seen this formula. Now, the bigger problem here is that you have to understand what happens in banks back in the day. Today, you put money in the bank, and that money is in the bank no matter what happens. It's federally insured. If the bank closes, you still have your money. In fact, uh, we don't even deal with a gold-based society anymore, so you might never actually deal with gold ever. But back then, what would happen is maybe you would give um, 
some gold to the bank of Mullen, and then when you gave that to me, I give you a piece of paper that says, you gave me this much gold. And you could use that paper to buy other things because there's some pile of gold in my bank that stands for that. But what happens if the bank of Mullen closes? What happens if the bank of Mullen gives out a bunch of really bad loans and you guys don't pay me back? And suddenly the money that you put in the bank of Mullen is gone. You have a piece of paper, but there's no longer a bank. Well, you're out of all your money. And this is what's going to happen in a lot of these bank panics is that the money simply evaporates when they close. And even if you've done nothing wrong, even if you paid off your loans, it doesn't matter. If the Bank of Mullen closes, you are completely out of money. It's not a good thing. Unfortunately, because of this bank panic, banks run out of money and the banks start closing, um, which is going to cause even more problems. Uh, thousands of banks are going to close. Thousands of people lose their money. It's really, really, really bad. It's going to be a really nasty effect on the American economy. It's going to make people not trust banks. You guys tend to trust banks now, but back in the day, we did not. Many Americans are going to refuse to deal with banks. And it's actually going to be another theme in this country of how do we get people to trust banks again? Spoiler alert, we don't trust banks until after World War II. It takes a long time because the system is pretty messed up. Okay, moving on. Oh good, let's go from that sad story to an even happier one. I mean sadder one, obviously. As Americans move westward, not only are we taking out bad loans to fund our farms, we're also kicking the butts of the Native Americans who happen to live there. As Americans move westward, they run into more and more Native Americans. There's going to be a group of tribes, we call them the Five Civilized Tribes. The Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles. Um, we call them the Five Civilized Tribes because they've dealt with whites for a while now. That's why they get that name. Uh, they typically can speak English. Um, they're used to working with us. They have several long-standing treaties with us that we <clears throat> ignore. Um, anyway, they have pre-existing treaties that say that they can be on this land. Um, we've already kicked them out from the shores of America to a little bit further inland. And now, as Americans are moving further inland, we're running into those same Native Americans we've already dealt with. And now we're telling them they have to move again. Well, the Natives aren't going to be very happy about this. Specifically in areas like Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. These Natives threaten war against the United States and vice versa if they don't move. Things are getting a little crazy out here in the American West. Things are getting a little crazy and, well, the Native Americans are going to have to move. It doesn't help that Andrew Jackson hates Native Americans. He grew up on the frontier and he does not like them. He refuses to treat the Native Americans as independent nations and he sees them as subjects of the United States, which he can deal with as he sees fit. He also declares that no natives can hold public office or vote, and they are essentially subjects, not citizens of the United States. As Americans move west, Andrew Jackson is not going to side with the natives. And this leads us to the Indian Removal Act. This is a story you probably already know from eighth grade, but this is not a happy story. Andrew Jackson and the federal government, let's not put all the blame on him, are, is going to force the remaining Native American tribes to give up over a hundred million acres of land and instead we're going to offer them 32 million acres of land further west you know in the beautiful glorious lovely state of Oklahoma we're gonna make them leave their land in the uh, area around the Mississippi River and we're gonna push them to the dry barren areas of the American Midwest and then eventually spoiler alert all the way out to places like Arizona and New Mexico, which are completely useless for anyone to live there with. Now most of the five tribes do leave peacefully. They see the writing on the wall, they know what's going to happen. Over a hundred thousand are going to leave their lands and move westward. Except for the Cherokee tribe. The Cherokee nation refuses to move and over 16,000 Cherokee stay behind, which leads us to two Supreme Court cases. The first one is the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831. It said that the Cherokees were a dependent nation within Georgia and not an independent nation. Essentially, this takes away a lot of their rights. 
Uh, in Worcester v. Georgia, it said that the natives deserve federal protection from the states. That's what it said, but that doesn't mean Andrew Jackson's going to do it. Andrew Jackson refused to deal with the Native Americans in a respectful manner. He refused to see them as citizens, even if the Supreme Court said they were. And he's basically going to say, no, they have to get out. You guys can look up the Treaty of New Wachota, but essentially what happens here is that a small tribe of Cherokee Indians are going to be tricked by Andrew Jackson into giving up all of the land for Native Americans or the Native American Cherokee um, for a very small sum of money. Jackson is then going to forcibly remove the remaining natives using the American army and force them to move west. They traveled along the Trail of Tears into Oklahoma. Of the remaining 16,000, 8,000 die in the journey. It's a horrible story, but it's the story of America. Andrew Jackson does not treat the Native Americans well at all. Here is a map. You guys can see the movement. You'll notice that the uh, lands that the Americans want are in the American South. Uh, these are going to be great farmland, specifically if you want to farm cotton. These are great farmland for cash crops. And you'll see the movement that is going to be required by the Trail of Tears, moving into, you know, the beautiful state of Oklahoma and later Nebraska. That's where all of these natives are going to be sent. It's an unfortunate story, but the sad part is it kind of happens more than once. I know. I know. I feel miserable about it too, but that's kind of what goes down. Not a happy story, but it is the true story of America. I will let you read this at your leisure. I will pause for a second while you do so. It's true. Okay, switching gears to a potentially happier note. Another theme of this era in America is actually going to be the rise of popular religion and social reforms are going to occur during this time period. So let's talk about the, uh, these religions and these social reforms and see what's going to go down. Okay, first because uh, it kind of happens chronologically. I kind of like telling you guys a chronological story. Um, let's look at the election of 1840. Van Buren's going to run again, but you know there was that horrible bank panic that happened because of improper funding and work by the federal government, so he's going to lose. The Whigs are finally going to decide to stick with only one candidate, and they select William Henry Harrison with the vice president, uh, being John Tyler. Harrison is a poor farmer who did not have any political enemies, so he's going to be a really good person to run for president during an era of considered corruption. Harrison is also a war hero. Remember the Battle of Tippecanoe from the War of 1812? Well, he is going to run for president under the campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Sorry, that's an old video game joke that you've never heard of. Um, anyway, Tippecanoe is going to be the battle, of course, and John Tyler is going to be the vice presidential candidate. So the campaign slogan, one of the most famous in history, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. William Henry Harrison was born and lived on the frontier, and America's moving that way, so they're going to feel a very close connection to this guy. Harrison's going to win easily, mainly due to the bank panic, and now we have a Whig as president. The election had one of the highest voter turnouts in history up to this point. In fact, even in losing, Martin Van Buren had 400,000 more votes than any previous president. Something to think about. Why? Well, there's two parties with, clear, with one clear candidate each, and they have completely differing viewpoints. So it energized the American public and he'd want to vote in, into this process. Plus, America's going to start thinking about this idea of reform and these two presidents are going to promise reforms when they are president. Of course, only one person becomes president, but let's talk about those reforms. We're going to go through a second great awakening in our rise of popular religion during this time period. The second great awakening is going to parallel the political movement at the time. Just like politics needed to make sense to the common person, religion needs to do the same thing. Also, the Amer Americans are moving out to the frontier, and the frontier is a wild place. 
religion's going to grow out in this area because you need order. These people are going to be living far away from the central government. The government's not there to protect these people. So these people are going to latch onto religion to give a set of rules and a set of morals and values to make up for the fact that they're not going to have a government out there to protect them. It's ironic that another way of protecting natural rights is to be more religious. If you follow any religion, you're going to be more likely to protect other people's natural rights and to not take away other people's property. So religion is going to take over the American Midwest in the absence of government. Religions promote law, order, morality, and they become popular very quickly. The two most po popular religions in America during this time period are the Methodist and the Baptist, who are going to use their fire and brimstone sermons, saying that you're all sinners and you're all going to burn in hell, um, but also preach that the average American can be saved through faith and good works through God. They told the American public what they wanted to hear. Your own salvation is in your hands. It isn't like the Puritans where it doesn't matter how good you are, God's already decided who's going to be there. Um, it's a, if you do good things, you go to heaven. If you do bad things, you go to hell. It's a very clear-cut idea of who's going where, and it's a very American idea of who's going where. You're good, you go good places. You're bad, you go bad places. Thousands upon thousands, perhaps even millions, of Americans are going to re-adopt religion during this time period um, and become more religious. We become a very much more religious nation. In fact, let's talk about one of these new religions that takes America by storm. Let's talk about Mormonism. Now, before I start, every time I teach about this, I always get some students that snicker and kind of make fun of Mormonism because, you know, South Park did. But I think the people that do that have not actually understood the message of that episode and the message of what they're trying to say. Um, I want to say something. Every religion in the world, every single one, I've studied most of them, every single one has something a little strange that you have to accept on faith for that religion to be true to you. Every religion does. So before you judge somebody for what they believe, think honestly about what you believe. And maybe look back and say, you know what? Maybe that is a kind of a silly belief that they have, but it's not any sillier than something else I believe. What's more important is what comes out of these religions and what they encourage you to be. They encourage you to be a better person. So don't snicker at a religion from being different from yours. Instead, think about what this religion makes people be and how people can be better people. Something to think about. In fact, those South Park creators even said that the craziest kooky religion out there is this one that believes that there was a big giant explosion in space that nobody can explain and it created everything. They call it the Big Bang. How funny is that religion? Anyway, um, let's talk about Mormonism. Mormonism is going to start by this gentleman named Joseph Smith who's going to found this religion. He claims he receives a new revelation from God. Now, his revelation from God is going to be very is going to strike a chord with the American public because there's one glaring flaw with the Old and New Testament of the Bible if you are a Christian. It doesn't mention half of the globe. North and South America are completely ignored in the Christian Bible. And Now granted, it's not going to be discovered for 1,500 years after Jesus dies, but still, there's a lack of America in the Bible. So when someone, as America is expanding westward and becoming more patriotic, when someone comes out and says, no, I've received a revelation from God, God did come to North America, suddenly it puts North America at the center of Christianity and it makes us feel more important. Americans are going to be very, very happy and proud of this religion coming out and they're going to be like, hey, you know what? This religion says that we matter in America. And in fact, we are the center of the most powerful religion of the world at this time period. It sounds kind of silly, but that's another big reason why Mormonism is going to take, uh, going to be so popular among people. Anyway, Smith and his followers, who started in New York, by the way, are not going to be very popular and universally supported. So Smith is going to travel from New York to land out west in order to practice his new religion. The Mormons are going to receive harsh treatment pretty much everywhere they went. 
because Smith seemed to contradict and undermine the authority of the accepted Bible of this time period. It doesn't help that one of the big issues that Joseph Smith was a, was a proponent of was this idea of polygamy or having more than one spouse. This is going to really upset uh, many of the other traditional Baptists and Methodists who believe the exact opposite. Smith is going to be murdered by a mob in Illinois, and his religion is taken under a new direction by Brigham Young. Brigham Young is going to take the Mormons from Illinois all the way out to Utah and attempted to build a utopian society there. The U.S. government, though, did not want to accept Utah as a state until 40 years after it applied, mainly because the original constitution of Utah had polygamy. Once polygamy was removed from the constitution of the state of Utah, it becomes a state, but it takes 40 years longer than it should have. And that is the story of really what some people call the only American religion, because it's the one religion that America didn't take from anyone else. Moving on. Not only are we going to become more religious, we're going to start being concerned with moral issues. The religious attitude of this time period is going to be channeled towards society as well. Soon issues such as the abolition of slavery, women's rights, temperance, and public education are going to come to the forefront of the American mindset. Social problems were clashes between good and evil, and reformers were convinced that they were doing the work of God if they got rid of these social problems. That would get them into heaven. So, um, that's going to be what's going to be happening during this time period. Reform movements are usually going to appeal to women. You have to understand, women didn't have the right to vote, many women, they didn't have the right to work, and many women weren't even really generally allowed outside of their homes. But as religion was a big fan of this as well, taught that it's the role of the woman to be um, the moral compass for the family. So if it's the job, accepted job in a religious household of the woman to take on the moral compass, well, then that means that they need to take on social reforms as well. So these movements are almost always led by women, and this is gonna be the big story of women during this time period. The first big fight that um, women are going to fight is going to be over this idea of temperance. Temperance means the moderation or complete removal of consumption of alcohol. Here's the problem. As more people moved out west, more people continued to practice of drinking heavily, mainly because it was the safest form of water. The average liquor consumption was half a pint of day of like hard liquor, and that's you know between six and eight ounces of hard liquor. That's a lot. That's a lot of alcohol for someone to be taking, especially when they're not drinking water to moderate it. And, unfortunately, when the men would drink, they would get drunk, they would come home and beat their wives and children. Enter, then, this new group called the American Temperance Society, which formed in 1834 and demanded a total, a and demanded, sorry, a total abstinence from liquor. They held, held rallies and published articles in newspapers attacking alcohol. And within the next 20 years, alcohol consumption is cut in half in America. This group wanted to outlaw liquor entirely. Now, this is going to be an ongoing story in the background. The year now is roughly around 1834. And at one point, about 80 years from now, we're going to completely ban alcohol in this country. I'll tell you when we get there. But this idea of lowering alcohol consumption for the safety of family is going to be an ongoing theme in the background of our story as we are talking for the next couple of months. Moving on. Another big problem we decide that we have in this country is the idea of schools. Early schools were terrible and with little focus on learning being done. Every school was operated a little bit differently and in general education was not very strong, especially in the American South. A reformer named Horace Mann is going to try to make schools more like they are today. Funded by the state, textbooks by grade level, man uh, mandatory compulsory attendance, etc. are going to be put in. That way um, we can have a more standard based education. That way the, an American in Georgia is going to learn the same thing as an American in New York. Education is also going to be seen as really important because Education is going to be a universal thing every American goes through, and it's going to help promote an American ideal or culture in an increasingly diverse society. We are a nation of immigrants, but 
where is a good place for everyone to learn the actual dominant culture, to learn the rules of America? Well, school. One of the reasons why um, schools are so important is that every single American's gone through it in some capacity. It's something that we all have in common regardless of our background. Schools are also a good way of practicing assimilation. You guys have ever heard the phrase, the melting pot? Well, what that means is that when you come to America, we kind of all force everyone to be the same. You see this picture here on the right? We kind of want everyone to end up being the same. This picture here on the left is also saying the same thing. A lot of people consider schools prisons for this idea because we lock you in a room and force you to learn things that some random people you don't know told you you have to learn, and we make every person learn the same thing the same way, even though studies show that's not how our brains work. But that's what we do. We called it forced assimilation. In that regard, it's a bad thing. But during this time period, assimilation is going to be a good thing because we have to define exactly what an American is. And this is where we start to get our identity. And schools, over time, become more and more and more important. This is also going to be seen as another area where women can take control. Many women become school teachers because they're still doing the accepted cultural and societal role of a woman, which is promoting uh, staying in the home and not actually physically working. But they're also allowed to get outside the house and earn some income. Although, by the way, there were many rules saying that uh, school teachers could not date especially the women, and they could not get pregnant because it would look bad for the school. I know, it was a weird time. Moving on. Another big social movement during this time period is we're going to start having the actual fight for abolition. Abolition is to get rid of slavery. By the year 1830, we have over 2 million slaves in North America. This is equal, eight, this is equal to 18% of the entire U.S. population. So this is a pretty big number. In the North and especially among the religious groups out west, this is going to be seen as an immoral activity. In 1831, uh, William Lloyd Garrison launches a newspaper called The Liberator, in which he published articles pushing for the abolition of slavery. He called for the immediate emancipation and civil and racial equality for all blacks. The American public, though, isn't too sure. Now, it's important to note, the North isn't necessarily racist, but they don't want total equality for blacks either. The North is going to basically get a lot of money from this idea of slavery, so they're not going to be a big proponent of getting rid of it. Um, and it's not like the North is some sort of racial safe haven for blacks. It's not. In fact, the church even refuses to embrace this concept, even though it is a moral reform that is brought on during the height of religion during this country. Something weird to think about, but that is a true story. Moving on. Women's rights. Um, another big argument during this time period is that women should have the right to vote. As urbanization grew and fewer women actually had to work on the farm, it seemed to make sense that women should have more roles than just to be someone that raises children. There are going to be two prevailing theories during this time period. The first one is women's rights, which comes from the Seneca Falls Convention that we will talk about more. We're actually going to read a document from the Seneca Falls Convention, so we'll learn more about this group later. The other thought is this idea called the cult of domesticity, which says that there are two spheres in the world. There is the um, work sphere that's meant for men, that's where men can go, and then there's the home. The home sphere is where women have control. Women have control over domestic issues, i.e. inside the house. Men have control of everything else. Seems kind of a weird idea, but those are the two thoughts. We have some women that are arguing that they need or sorry, demand and deserve total equality, and we have other women arguing, and men, arguing that women should just stay inside the home and have total control there. Last thought. The last big idea of this time period, the reform movement, is going to be to help out the criminals or the insane. The worst people in society needed the most help, and reformers are going to focus heavily on criminals for this purpose. The idea was that God uh, would not make people that are wicked, so if they are wicked, they need to be fixed rather than punished. If something happens to someone that makes them become a criminal, obviously, because God would never make criminals, something happened that they need to be fixed. So we're going to decide to build penitentiaries, which are going to come into existence to help cure the criminals and uh, put them in a system of rigid discipline until they learn to not be criminals anymore. 
At the same time, we also have issues with people that are mentally handicapped. Um, Dorothea Dix is going to support the mentally handicapped by building insane asylums for them rather than simply prisons or executions. She's going to try to rehabilitate people that are mentally handicapped and criminally insane. It's going to show part of the reform of this time period. And that, my friends, is where this chapter ends. I know that we went a lot. We went from the creation of the Democratic uh, Party under Jackson all the way up to the 1840s and social movements and social reforms. Again, don't be so concerned if you don't see how all the pieces fit yet. We will step back and you will see everything once the Civil War breaks out. All of these pieces will fit. Okay, This is a big puzzle. This is a big picture that I'm painting. We have to put a lot of steps in place first. And a lot of these steps don't seem like they fit together right now. They will when we get to the end. Take it slow, go in the order I gave you, and you will be okay. Thank you for watching. I hope this helped clear up some issues. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I will get back to you whenever I feel like it. Have a good day.